sexy police officer. And during the night, Ashley would introduce her boyfriend, Chris, to Mike. A rumor going around at the time was that Mike Casey had told the security supervisor at the bar to have Chris removed because he wanted Chris out of the picture that night to flirt with Ashley. And then later, after Chris was gone, Mike would be the one to give Ashley a ride home. The Minneapolis Police Department never even questioned Mike formally. And when asked why Casey wasn't questioned, even though he had driven the victim's girlfriend home and might have valuable information, they said, quote, He's a married man with children. We don't want to break up a family. End quote. This is not the first time you hear of police doing stuff like this in the United States. I'm not going to get on a political opinion about police in this video, but it's just very interesting to me that because this was a fellow police officer and they knew he was married with kids, they weren't going to investigate him any further, which clearly is not fair by any means. Number three. While retracing Chris's steps, the private investigator realized that the route home for Chris would have taken him over the Hennepin Avenue Bridge. The investigator found that the Federal Reserve Bank had two outside security cameras facing in that direction. But when the bank reviewed the footage, there was no sign of a Chris. So that led them to believe that he actually had not started to walk home. Number four. Chris's family knew they needed to try and find out where Chris went if they were ever going to find out what had happened to him. They hired a canine unit and two different bloodhounds tracked Chris's scent from the Lone Tree Bar to a restaurant across from the bar called Times Square Pizza and Subs. From there, the bloodhounds each tracked Chris's scent further to an underground parking garage next to the pizza shop. Chris's smell would come to a stop for these dogs around the parking stalls number 89 and 90. A very interesting fact is that on Halloween night, the bouncer from the Lone Tree Bar and Grill that kicked Chris out had been barking in one of those spots. The bloodhounds also found a hint of Chris on the vehicle that had been parked there that night. With a possible scene to investigate, a search for evidence began. The private investigators would recover blood droplets, a red feather fragment, and red string that very well could be parts of the headband Chris had been wearing that night for his costume. Number five. The private investigator started looking more closely at the movement around the pizza shop and the garage the night of Halloween. Several people had 
had seen a group of 10 or more people attacking someone in front of Times Square Pizza and Subs that night, but nobody could confirm if that person had in fact been Chris number six. From the pathologist's report, it is known that Chris's blood alcohol level was 0.12%. So although he had alcohol in his system, he was not in a place of being blackout drunk. Tests also showed traces of the chemical GHB in his system, which is used to sedate people and is referred to as like the date rape drug or roofies. Number seven, the pathologist who performed the autopsy also noted some strange inconsistencies with the body if he drowned. First, he was found with his arms crossed in front of him. First, he was found with his arms crossed in front of him, which is odd for victims who fall into the water and drown. They are usually found with their arms out at their sides. Drowning victims usually also have clothing that is disheveled as well, but Chris's shirt was still tucked into his drawstring pants, and the slip on his moccasins were still on his feet. And these slip-on moccasins were still on his feet, which led the pathologist to believe that Chris was dead and rigor mortis had already set in when he had been placed in the water. Number eight, when Chris was pulled from the river, a clump of hair was in his left hand and this hair was never tested. It had been filed away after being labeled foreign matter in left hand. Finally, years later, it was tested and it turns out that it was Chris's own hair. Number nine, lack of bruising seemed to throw the family off. Chris was an avid lacrosse goalie and was usually covered in bruises on his legs and arms. He had played two games and been to practice days before he vanished, so there most likely should have been bruises on his body. Since there were not, his family wondered if he had been kept alive for a few days before being killed and disposed of. And number 10, the last inconsistency found was this. A hydrologist who studied the Mississippi River did not believe that Chris's body could have been in the water for four months without being spotted. He had researched the temperatures in the area and found that the river did not freeze over until January. Also, the area under the 3rd Avenue Bridge where Chris's body was found had been combed for weeks after he disappeared. Four years after Chris went missing and then turned up in the river, his family finally got the police to reopen the investigation. By this time, a new police chief took over and he sat down with 
found 
was recovered. However, in 2010, the Center for Homicide Research released a 12-page report titled Drowning the Smiley Face Murder Theory, which would debunk the smiley face killer claims with multiple points, including time order problems in cases, omnipresent graffiti, differing styles of smiley faces, no criteria for the distance between a smiley face and deceased body, no evidence of victim trauma in the vast majority of cases, and well-documented instances of intoxicated men falling into nearby bodies of water. In 2008, the FBI released a statement also reiterating that their agency has found no connections between cases. They were quoted saying, To date, we have not developed any evidence to support links between these tragic deaths or any evidence substantiating the theory that these deaths are the work of a serial killer or killers. The vast majority of these instances appear to be alcohol-related drownings, end quote. However, many people still believe that the smiley face killers do in fact exist and that they are a murderous cult that operate through the dark web selecting their victims in various cities and drug them before killing them. From 1997 until now, there have been over 300 cases worldwide and the deaths are chillingly the same. Young men are being found drowned in waterways in England using the same technique as in the United States. 1997 saw the real beginning of what people called the smiley face killers when young college men began disappearing after a night out drinking with friends and would somehow get separated from them only to turn up dead allegedly found drowned in water. As we discussed, these deaths and many more are being put down to accidental drowning, but in some cases with no sign of water in some of the men's lungs. The person was dead before they were placed into the water, like was suspected of Chris Jenkins. Some men had been beaten, while others appeared to have no injuries. Some of the deceased males had faint ligature marks on their necks and wrists, but how is it that so many are found dead in the same scenario? Autopsy reports vary as to the length of time bodies have been in the river compared to what other examiners state. How could autopsy reports for the same body have different dates for the time of death? Some of these young men have been reported missing for months, then found allegedly drowned not far from where they vanished, and claimed to have always been in the water. The bodies of other men found are also raising questions as they are found in locations that would be considered impossible to access. Furthermore, decomposition of the body doesn't match the time of death. So, where were these bodies being held and by whom? There are so many questions that do not have any logical answers. Strange also that the police don't seem interested in looking further into the deaths with so much conflicting information about the deceased. The time of death and the GHP regularly found in their system. So many different theories are brought up, but there is nothing solid to prove foul play or murder. But there are many unanswered questions that 
whoever is doing this and is responsible has a 100% strike rate. And with no one willing to look at the evidence they have, these deaths will never be fully explained if this really is a murderous cult operating over the dark web. It makes sense why it would be spread out in different cities and some things would be slightly off from one another because different people would be acting out the crime, but they would have the similarities of make it look like a drowning and a smiley face found nearby, so they wouldn't be exactly identical, but pretty close. That concludes the discussion of the smiley face killers. Let me know what you think about this. Do you think that the smiley face killers are real and that they have mastered this killing spree and are going undetected? Or do you think that this is just a fictitious story that some group of men are just convinced is real? You let me know. I am somebody that tends to believe stuff like this, especially when it comes to police not wanting to investigate certain topics or not doing a good job at the initial investigation. And I provided 10 discrepancies that the private investigator discovered during Chris Jenkins' investigation and so stuff like that makes me question what is it that the police knew and wanted to hide. At least that's where my brain goes, so I am team a smiley face killer is real. Let me know what you are. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining me for